That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about The Blackening, the 14th film directed by Tim Story, which premiered at the 2022 Toronto International Film Festival. It also just uh, played at the 2023 Tribeca Film Festival before Lionsgate releases it theatrically just in time for Juneteenth, uh, June 16th, 2023. The director, what other films do I know from them? You know quite a few of his films, actually. Uh, his... Probably best revered film is his third, which was Barbershop. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. My favorite is his uh, reboot of Shaft from 2019. You do like that movie. Uh-huh. Oh, well, I like all the Shafts, but I... <laughs> yes, he does. Go ahead. Tim Stories was uh, a, a, a great surprise. Uh, he also did the first two Fantastic Four films, oh. which I don't believe I've seen. He's done the two Think Like a Man films. He's done the Ride Along films, which with Ice Cube and Charlie Day. Um, Taxi with Queen Latifah, which I believe is a remake of a French film. And then there is, uh, his last was the Tom and Jerry with uh, Chloe Grace Moretz. I had a really good time watching this movie. Uh, I did as well. Yeah. Yeah. The story, seven, this is the IMDb description. Seven black friends go away for the weekend and end up trapped in a cabin with a killer who has a vendetta. Will their street smarts and knowledge of horror films help them stay alive? Probably not. Uh, well, that's not true because they do all make it in the end. But uh, oh, oh, just spoiling it right up front. Well, I well, I think that's in the trailer, right? Nearly everyone makes it at the end. Nearly, uh, as you, you were pondering, uh, where is Yvonne Orji in the poster art uh, before we started the film? And I, you know, that's a telltale sign right there. Yes. So this feels like if you mix scary movie with scream, and then you said saw. Saw gave me bodies, 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 and you can even throw it. References a little further back to people in a creepy house being uh, killed off a la Agatha Christie or House on Haunted Hill or 13 Ghosts, etc. Their get out vibes. Mm -hmm. uh, yep, get out. I thought of a few yeah. times too. But um, this is a comedy to be sure. This is not a horror film. No. So check, <laughs> check those expectations at the door. And if you do, uh, I think you'll have a really good time. Yeah, I laughed a lot. I was shouting at the screen. Uh, the theater we were in, people were really reacting well to it, which I, was a lot of fun for me. I think it's also been a while since there's been... And I think Tim Story's strengths are with an ensemble, actually, which kind of is, is rare in today's world, where all of the characters have a moment to shine and have something to add and something to say, and were also entertaining to boot. I really liked the central characters. Mm -hmm. They worked really well together. They were a lot of fun. Uh, so it was written by Tracy Oliver of Girls Trip and Harlem fame. She also is a barbershop barbershop alum because she wrote uh, the last, I think the last iteration of that in 2016. Uh, and then also Dwayne Perkins, uh, who's in the Upshaws, uh, which we're both fans of. Yep. And that uh, he also stars in the film as the character named Dwayne. And I'm trying to think who my favorite character was, and maybe it was Dwayne. I think he was mine as well. He's very good. Mm -hmm. So the story is that this group of friends, they're all friends from college, they've all done well for themselves, and they, it seems like their tradition is to have like little reunions once a year. So this year, it's at this lovely luxury cabin in the woods. And uh, it appears that Yvonne Orji's character has planned it with her boyfriend, played by Jay Farrow. Morgan and Sean. Mm -hmm. So they arrive first to make sure everything is how it should be. And this is a beautiful house, so it has a game room. And they go into the game room. And there is... The centerpiece of this game room is a game called The Blackening. And when they open up the game, there is, like... The, the center of the board is this, like... The head of, like, a Sambo doll... And so, of course, they're like, WTF. Yeah, it's very creepy. And the doll talks, so it's telling them, like, this is the game, you need to do this, or you'll die. And, of course, they think it's a joke, so they start playing, and they are both incapacitated very quickly. Because they answer the first question wrong. Because they answer the first question incorrectly. So they... Because I think the first question is, like, are, have there ever been, like, black characters who made it to the end of a movie. Name a black character who's made it to the end of a horror film. Which, and they highlight Jada Pinkett and Omar Epps in Scream 2. Which is, uh, of course, incorrect. But it's interesting because there is a black character in Scream 2 who does make it to the end, Dwayne Martin. Oh, oh. Can you name any others? No. Loretta Devine, actually, in Urban Legends Final Cut. Oh. And uh, the, the, the OG go-to is Keith David in The Thing. Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, but the funny bit 
they have of bringing up Jada and Omar is Yvonne Orji and Jay Fair. She says, uh, Morgan says something like, oh, but the studio couldn't afford to keep them to the end. And then they share this And they look, look at each other like, they can't afford to keep us here either. <laughs> I thought that was really yeah. good. So then the credits happen, and then we cut to the remaining six friends showing up. Mm -hmm. And it's Juneteenth weekend. There's a little tension between the characters because Sinqua's character used to be in a relationship in college with Antoinette Robertson. Namdi and Lisa. Mm -hmm. And he cheated on her, so Dwayne is... Her bedrock. Her best friend, so he doesn't like Sinqua's character. So there's a little tension there. Mm -hmm. But it's a smooth start because they start off playing spades. Uh, Dwayne's character is given Molly, so he's tripping. But they quickly find the game room because they're wondering where are our two friends who organized this and they get locked in the game room and then the game begins. So they're told they need to... They have to answer 10 questions correctly and it's revealed with this old television screen that Morgan is being held captive and she will be allowed to live if they answer the 10 questions. And we'll talk about the questions because I thought they were really funny mm -hmm. but uh, then they are told that they need to choose the blackest of the group. Because it's the six friends, but then there's one additional person added. added. Clifton, played by... Jermaine Fowler. And immediately we know something's off with him, and you would assume he's the killer. And he is. He's responsible for the killings, but he's not the mass killer we see. And he's introduced Shanika... Is that her name? Play yeah. X Mayo. Mm -hmm. uh, goes to a, a convenience store, a la, the, there's a creepy guy behind the counter, a la, the hills have eyes. Yeah. And that's where we meet Clifton. And right away she's put off by him, like, you're here, you're coming to the party. Uh, it, and um, immediately. So there immediately. are actually seven of them in this room. And they have to choose the blackest one to be sacrificed. And if they do that, they can leave. So they're playing a game of like, well, who's the black... Or they're trying to figure out who's the blackest, but ultimately they decide to choose Clifton because they, he, they don't even know him like that. They don't even like him like that. So And then he starts saying troubling things like he voted for Trump. So they're like, oh, it's you. He's, You're being sacrificed. He's never watched Friday. Yeah, so they choose him. Uh, and then, so he gets taken out. But... And on his way out, he says, all lives matter. So they feel good about sacrificing him. But then we find out that they didn't do it properly. So they're still having to play this game. But ultimately, they're told that they have a chance that the killer's going to unlock the doors and they can get a three-minute head start. And if they can make it out alive, then, then they can. But they decide to split the group in half mm -hmm. so because some of them don't want to leave the house. So... Three leave, three stay. And the three who leave come in contact with the killer and kill the killer. So they go back to the house. And then we can get into how this happens. But then when they get back to the house, we realize that there is another killer. They already realized that because they had stabbed one in the foot. and the one. So they then they kill the second killer. So then they think they're in the clear. And then they go looking for Yvonne Orji and Jay Farrell. And when they get down to the basement, they see Clifton's character there. And then he wakes up. And he's like, aha, like Scooby-Doo, uh, yeah. I'm the killer, and I'm going to tell y'all why. He explains why he wants to do this. Clifton went to college with all these people, and there was a party one day. Ten years ago. Ten years ago. On Juneteenth. Juneteenth weekend, and they made fun of him, saying he wasn't black enough. And he was so embarrassed that he decided to drink alcohol for the first time. And as a result, he was driving drunk. And hit and killed a woman. So he ended up going to prison for four years for vehicular manslaughter. So all this time he's been plotting how to get revenge. And this is how he was going to do it. And we can talk more about it. But they end up killing him. And then the end of the film is now these six black people who just had to kill like three people plus two more dead bodies in the house. Or three more dead bodies. They're like, well, we can't call the police because if they show up, it's going to be a problem. So how do we get help here without us getting in trouble? They decide to call the fire department. <laughs> I thought this was really funny, the mm -hmm. end. They call the fire department, and then the fire department shows up and hits them with the hose. <laughs> the end. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I thought this was a very strong comedy. I, uh, I agree. I, I do think that the third act reveal... 
I, I wish it had allowed for something a little more intelligent with the, both the motivation for Clifton and also making it maybe not so frivolous a statement about colorism, if you will, because, you know, the film is it's really playing like mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the blackest of them all. And then and that's what's interesting, the conversation they have when it comes down to it when it, when it feels like somebody might get a reprieve because there's a, a biracial character, Allison, played by Grace Byers of Empire, who they clown the whole time because she's got a white dad until uh, it comes down to where... It matters that she's black and right. all of a sudden she's black. Yeah, there are some, there is some commentary that does work, but I agree. I feel like the third act was languid because the premise of why he's doing this, it just, I guess I, I'm fine accepting this is not like a serious horror film because I enjoyed it as a comedy, but I do think that it would have been nice to feel like the person responsible for what's happening actually, it, that there was some validity to it. Because Clifton's kind of annoying. So then as the audience, I was like, well, I can see why they clowned your ass back in the day because you are kind of whack. And then the fact that you're doing all of this because of that. Right. I mean, yes, you did kill a woman, but that's your fault you were drinking and driving. Right. And then it's... I, I, how he organized it all seems impossible. So, like, like impossible. Once you start pulling at those strings, the, the the premise seems to fall apart. But I mean, hey, I like this hell a lot more than something like because Man Night. the two killers are twins. These hills have eyes looking dudes who agree to kill these eight black people for a hundred dollars each. Mm -hmm. And I and then they're using like a cell phone, like a signal blocker. All of that was just a little too ridiculous which, for me. Which is very kind of like most dangerous game targeting black people. So going through my notes, the film opens with it saying that it's based on true events that never happened. <laughs> that was funny. Um, again, Dwayne is so funny. So his character in the movie is supposed to be gay. And yeah, he has... I think ever, I, I really like Shanique. I think she's really funny. But Dwayne, him on Molly... Mm -hmm. and, <laughs> Him doing his little dance was really cute. Um, Sinqua is definitely like the literal and figurative straight man. He he is, but he's got great screen presence. And after seeing him in Nanny, which I thought he was a standout in, and I didn't like the White Men Can't Jump remake, but, uh, you know, he's definitely, uh, I, I don't know. I like him, yeah. Uh, and then Melvin Gregg plays the character King. I thought he was really funny. Mm -hmm. And his character right away is making some... Uh, like an alcoholic beverage and we see him making it which is basically kool-aid with like all like half of the the decanter is sugar like just watching him push the sugar and your teeth hurt watching the, put the sugar. and when everyone tastes it they're like god damn but his beverage is important because a couple of characters say like drinking all this sugar you're going to get cramps mm -hmm. so towards the end of the film when he's part of the group that leaves the house when they come in contact to with the killer, it's they're trying to swim across. Shanika's character wants to swim across the lake to get help, but King can't swim because he got shot in the arm twice with an arrow. So he decides to hide up in a tree. So the killer sees Shanika swimming and is shooting at her. So King decides to drop out of the tree like a koala bear, and then they realize that the that killer can't fight, like he cannot swing or kick. So King is whooping his ass until the cramps kick in from that damn Kool-Aid he made. <laughs> I thought that was so funny. And then Shanika, her outfit that she's wearing is super cute. Like when you see it like full on. But the silhouette of it looks well, like, like an gets... 80s prom dress. So when she comes out of the water and all we see is her silhouette. She's bedraggled. Yeah. <laughs> that was so good. Should we talk about the game? Okay, the board game questions. So they were so funny. They have questions like, I think the first question is like, who's Sojourner Truth? And then one, of, and it's like multiple choice. And one of the answers is she's Rosa Parks or something. The, 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 or no, she's Harriet Tubman. The best one was, what does NAACP stand for? That was good. Then they have them naming off like black inventors. Mm -hmm. uh, they have, one of them has to sing the second verse of the black national anthem. And, and yes, it's actually... Allison's character right. who knows the lyrics and she's the biracial one and then her singing was funny mm -hmm. um, they have a question about 
like how many seasons was the dark skin Aunt Viv on Fresh Prince of Bel Air? That was funny. But the best one was they have to name five black characters on Friends, and they're all trying to play like we don't watch that shit. Right. But then one by one, they're like, "Oh, Aisha Tyler, yeah. Craig Robinson," and then it's like, and then when they all answer correctly, the Sambo doll says, "Like I don't know, I didn't watch that shit." The, the, yeah, the correct not no, the correct answer should have been was I don't watch that shit. I watched Living Single. Yeah, li- yeah Living Single. <laughs> that was really good. Mm-hmm. Um, then Allison. Because Allison gets hurt and she asks for a painkiller from... Because Shanika has already given Dwayne Molly. So then when Allison asks for like ibuprofen, Shanika accidentally gives her some Adderall. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then she's doing on some bionic woman shit. Oh my God. She's on, yeah, she's like... It, it's very Matrix. I mm-hmm. thought that was really funny. Because mm-hmm. then at a point when they're running away, she's like, I need to take a break. <laughs> yeah, she's like, they're running from the killer. She's like, I just need to just go without me. <laughs> um... So, Dwayne's character keeps saying when he gets nervous, he vomits. So, he says it like three times, so you know it's going to happen. You know happen. it's coming. So, the three who stayed in the house, they know there's a killer there, so they hide in the vents. And then, Dwayne helps, because the killer sees they're in the vents. So, Dwayne distracts the killer, and then he goes to tell them, like, you know, what's going on. So, now that so now Dwayne is in the vents with the other two. And the killer sees them, and right as he's about to shoot them with the arrow, Dwayne throws up on the killer. And this is right after it reveals another red herring, because there's the white park ranger, which I'm forgetting that man's name uh, from, he, he was on uh, the Drew Carey show. That's right. Uh, who we, we... As the audience, we assume. You most definitely assume, but it turns out at the last minute that he, he's he, not. He was actually there to help. But he has one of those awkward interac- interactions, like, I'm one of the, not, I'm one of the good ones. So it's Al, it's Lisa who ends up killing the second killer and she bludgeons him to death with a candlestick holder that they all make fun of her for. Like, you were supposed to grab a weapon and you grab this candlestick holder, but she bludgeons him. So she's covered in blood and tissue. So after she kills him, she kind of like makes up with Dwayne because they got into an argument about Sinqua's character. So she wants a hug from Dwayne. And he's like, girl, I'm not hugging you with all this blood. So they start playing patty cake. So many funny moments. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then there's a couple Eddie Murphy references. You have Jay Farrow doing his uh, the Coming to America um, impression, which yep. Jermaine Fowler was in the sequel to that as Murphy's kid. But Jermaine Fowler, Jermaine Fowler is Clifton. is doing. It has to be an homage to Bowfinger. Yeah, and he did it really well. He did it very well. Speaking of Clifton, at the end when Clifton's like um, telling them like I'm going to kill you all now that you know what my plan was. All of the characters, they've been sort of like talking telepathically. Mm -hmm. So then Dwayne and Allison and uh, Sinqua's character are all talking. And then we find out that Clifton can also like hear what they're saying. I thought that was really funny. But overall, yeah, this is a super strong comedy to me. Mm-hmm. Um, I would definitely recommend seeing it in a theater with people, bring friends, shout out the screen. I think that's what this is intended for. I think so. I think, you know, if you like something like Cabin in the Woods, which I don't think is a horror film in the least either, but uh, is funny and has some similar beats, I think that... It also feels like, very black, which I love. And I and it's mm-hmm. like unapologetically black. So mm-hmm. I, I kind of love that maybe certain audiences might be uncomfortable with the film. Yeah. yeah. I, I would uh, love to be a fly on the wall in some theaters in some cities in this country. Uh, did I didn't I learned today that the casting director is Leah Daniels Butler. Who do you think she's related to? Not Lee Daniels. Lee, yeah, Lee Daniels Butler. That's his, his younger sister. I thought that when I saw her name come across. The I did too. I'm like Leah and Lee. They can't. That can't. Be. I know. I'm like they can't be. <laughs> but oh yeah, wow! Apparently. Cool. What would you give this movie? Uh, three and a half. I think is fair. I thought it was very good. I would give it three and a half out of five. Hit the thanks button. Listen to our podcast. Bye. <laughs>